Welcome to Matthew Felix On Air, coming to you from San Francisco, California. People who create, people who make a difference. And hope you had a great week. I did. Lots going on in San Francisco, especially this weekend. It's Fleet Week, so the Blue Angels were circling my building all week. And uh, not all week, but the last few days they've been circling my building while they practiced for this weekend show, which just got over, I think. I think they ended that today. And uh, obviously quite a sight to behold, especially when you're not expecting it and they fly by your building so close you can literally see the pilots in the cockpits. So that was pretty impressive and um, kind of distracting while I was trying to do this and prepare or prepare for this show and do a bunch of other stuff, but pretty cool at the same time. The Hardly Strictly Bluegrass Festival also was going on. I don't know, maybe it's still going on, probably wrapping up uh, in Golden Gate Park, and that's always a great time. I actually forgot it was happening this year, so I don't know who was there, but I do know that they always have an amazing lineup, and so and, and it's free. So once again, I'm sure that was a great time. Just across the bay, the Mill Valley Film Festival got underway with lots of big stars hitting the red carpet. And of course, I talked with Zoe Elton all about, you, all about uh, this year's festival a couple of weeks ago, complete with trailers for a few of the new films. And you can watch that on Facebook, here on Facebook, or on YouTube, or you can listen, of course, on Google Play or iTunes. Speaking of big stars, next week, uh, Matthew DeCoster will be on to tell us all about Literary Deathmatch, which, in addition to being a big event in its own right all over the country, and I think, I think they have some events abroad as well, uh, but it's also part of this year's Litquake event here in San Francisco. I've never been, but on the promo reel on their website, it looks like it's quite the event with past judges, including Michael C. Hall, no, formerly known as Dexter, and lots of other really cool characters, uh, Tig Notaro and Moby, amongst other celebrity judges. So I'm really looking forward to checking out Literary Deathmatch for the first time and talking to Matthew next week all about it. Later in the month, uh, Michelle Alcedo will be on to talk about the work that the organization Open House does for LGBT seniors. I'm really looking forward to having her on the show. And then the following week, Anne Sigmund will be here to discuss her in-progress memoir, Scrambling Back, about not only surviving stroke, but resuming her travels around the world after she had the stroke. And so we're going to talk about uh, the stroke itself and stroke in general, but also the memory loss that comes with that, autoimmune disease, and again, travel. Two new episodes of my new Words and Images podcast are out this week. On Wednesday, my interview with Litquake co-founder Jane Ganahl comes out in honor of this week's or uh, this year's festival kicking off this Thursday. And, of course, uh, Jack Bolware, Litquake's other co-founder, was just on the show last week, specifically talking about this year's festival. But with Jane, I talked about the festival in, in a broader, at a higher level, talked about its origins, its evolution, um, that sort of thing. So check both of those episodes out. And if you live in the San Francisco Bay Area, then go to Litquake. On Thursday, the episode that I did with filmmaker Hervé Cohen gets released, and I talked with Hervé about his fascinating interactive film project, Life Underground. If you haven't seen it, go to life-underground.com. Um, Hervé travels the world, and he overse he's overseas right now, actually, in, in Helsinki, I think, filming some more episodes for this uh, Life Underground project. But what he does is he, he rides the metros in all of the or the subways in all of these different cities, and he selects people who essentially look interesting, look like they might have fascinating stories tell to tell, and he approaches them, gets their permission, and then films these really intimate, revealing, surprising conversations with these people. And it's really, really honestly a fascinating project, so I highly recommend you go check it out. It's life-underground.com. And um, not only do I want you to check out that website, but again, check out my episode where I interviewed Hervé all about the, pro all about the project because uh, we had a great conversation. If you like those new episodes, please subscribe, rate, and review um, to help me get the word out. It really, really helps. All right. That is enough of uh, news and goings on. Let's get to today's show. David Goldman and Kenneth Michael Cohen uh, have lived in San Francisco for over, for over 45 years, active in the past in the civil rights movement for the LGBT community. For the past 12 years, they have worked tire tirelessly for the rights of medical cannabis patients and for cannabis law reform. From 2008 through 2013, they were also on the leadership team of the San Francisco chapter of Americans for Safe Access, the nation's larg largest organization devoted to medical cannabis advocacy. In 2014, they became leaders in the San Francisco chapter of the Brownie Mary Democratic Club, 
continuing their work on cannabis law reforms. Did I say that right? I got the order right? Yeah, okay. Uh, I messed it up before when we were talking. And uh, David served on San Francisco's Medi Medical Cannabis Task Force from 2009 to 2011. Welcome, David and Michael. Now you got to grab the mic. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. I'm David Goldman. And I'm Michael Cohen. All right. Nice to have you guys here. So uh, as I just said in your intro, you've been in San Francisco for over 45 years. Has the city changed at all in that time? Profoundly. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, any highlights for how it's changed? I think the major years? change since yeah. the 70s is the lack of affordability for low to moderate income people in living here. And that's an issue that needs to be addressed. And also, since 1981, when Reagan cut the housing budget for the poor by 80%, we developed a homeless problem. Yes, and that's that we could have a whole other show on that. But um, before we get started on cannabis, a couple things I want to mention. The first is I want to thank Kevin Reed of the Green Cross Dispensary. I had had someone else scheduled for this show today, and uh, they had to cancel at the last minute. So I did some searching online, and I just sort of blindly contacted Kevin. I wasn't sure. I saw lots of dispensaries, and he just, you know, the website looked impressive, and it seemed like, judging by his photo, he looked like a nice guy. So I really appreciate, um, he was unable to be here, obviously, but I really appreciate him putting us in contact. And uh, so I just wanted to, to acknowledge that and thank him for that. Uh, something else I wanted to do before we get started, I wanted to ask you about your friendship with Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un, because I saw a photo online with the, with the four of you together, and it surprised me, given your political beliefs, that you guys would find common ground. Can you tell me how that happened? We were in Honolulu on Kalakaua Avenue in Waikiki, uh -huh. and there were two costumed actors, oh. one wearing a Donald Trump mask and one wearing a Kim Jong-un mask. Oh, so it wasn't, very the high real, it wasn't the real people. No, they weren't in they Hawaii. They were very convincing. They were just street performers, you know, looking for I change. thought maybe they were, you know, doing a summit there and you guys ran into each other, so. They saw us with our hats on, uh -huh. and once they, they engaged us with our hats, and one thing led to another and it was it was a barrel of laughs it was it was so funny and people were responding you uh -huh, know uh -huh. uh, 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 the tourists and, and other people they were just getting a, an incredible response from people well i almost put that picture up but then i thought i don't know you guys and i didn't know how much of a sense of humor you would have so i didn't publish the photo but i at least wanted to acknowledge it because i thought it was pretty funny okay so now let's actually talk about cannabis um but the first thing i want to ask about is you know, so I noticed when I was preparing for today's show, and I've noticed in the past also just when we're talking about legislation and the politics surrounding pot and cannabis, is it seems like when we're talking about it politically, when we're talking about it sort of uh, in, a, in a context that's more than just getting high at home, we use the word cannabis. And so I was just curious, do am, am I right in that um, – in this context, you're careful about whether it's cannabis, marijuana, or pot. Do those different words have different sort of, do they carry different meanings in, the, in these contexts? And do you deliberately kind of use cannabis, for example? We find cannabis to be the appropriate term, marijuana secondarily, and pot is rather derisive. We tend to avoid using that. Or reefer or weed. Cannabis is its proper name, and we want to give it the respect the plant deserves. I wanted to say that some people also call it dope, uh -huh. and that's a real that's a real um, uh, stigma. Uh -huh. It puts a real stigma on, on cannabis, cannabis sativa, and um, we are working on on uh, eradicating fear and the stigma against cannabis. Yeah. So you want to be conscious about how you're referring to to cannabis. How you speak about it is is really important. Yeah. The language that we use to describe it and the experience. And uh, and, and the pe that includes the people who who use it. Mm -hmm. We need to have respect. Make sure uh, that they're the using the correct terms. The and correct terminology right. is important. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so as I said in your intros, you you started. You actually started your activist work, or at least part of a, a big part of your early activist work was in the LGBT community. So we're going to talk primarily about cannabis, but I'm curious since that's kind of the origins of your activism. Can you just tell us a little bit about how you got involved in that and the work that you did? In the LGBT community, I was the founding vice president of the Harvey Milk Club back oh in the really? day in 1977. Oh, okay. It was founded at my home. So for the first two years, oh, wow. I, was the, I was the founding vice president. And we founded the club because at the time, the Alice B. Douglas Club 
uh, had voted down a change in their name to include the word gay in it. And we were upset about that. Also, we wanted to be beyond just being a gay identified club with the name, with the word gay in it. We also wanted to form the nucleus around Harvey Milk's campaign. And the Alice folks were primarily for Rick Stokes. Oh. Their issues committee, which I chaired at the time, came up with a no endorsement because we didn't have enough votes at the, we recommended Harvey Milk over with one point more than Rick Stokes. They were both very good on gay civil rights issues. But we, uh, when the club voted, there were not 60 votes for Rick Stokes. So the club went officially no endorsement. And that angered the people there. And when, they, when we try to change the name of the club to include the word gay in it, the more conservative lesbians, Delmar and Phyllis Lyon, amended the motion to read gay, lesbian, and other Democratic club, and then it got defeated. Other so sounds kind of, So they again, were against language. it then. Now, Alice has changed over the years, make no mistake, but that was how I got involved. And I, in 1975, I was active in a group called Bay Area Gay Liberation, BAGEL for short. BAGEL, And yeah. our big <laughs> claim to fame was we did a lot of work around exposing Herb Cain as a bigot in his oh, from really? his column. Uh-huh. We had a column with all his anti-gay quotes called Three Dot Yellow Journalism because he used to call his column Three Dot Journalism. Oh, interesting. And we also did a fire safety check of all the gay bars in San Francisco, and we urged them to make fire safety improvements and cleanliness improvements in their bathrooms, which some of them did, and those that didn't, we turned over to the city so the city could come after them to get them up to code. Interesting. Okay, so it sounds like we have a whole other show there. I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of, of gay history and local gay history, and, and which of course is also national and international gay history that um, I might have to have you back to talk about. So, uh, okay, but so that's kind of how you started your activist work, but then how did you transition into cannabis activism? I was always a big cannabis consumer, and I knew it helped me. And in 1996, I did a little peripheral work for Prop 215, but I was working full time. And it helped so you medicinally. You're right, saying. it helped yeah. me medicinally. Mm -hmm. And in 2006, when I retired from teaching, and Michael was already retired from his work as a gardener in the Rec and Park Department in San Francisco, we. Um, got involved in the cannabis movement. I was active in um, a, an organization called SIR, S -I -R, the Society for Individual Rights, mm -hmm. back, in the, back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. they, had a, they had a place on 6th Street, and you could go to a dance, and we had dances there. And then I also was active in the LSP Tokos Club, and for many years and, and was a member and was active. And then I, in 85, when I turned uh, HIV positive for, a uh, for AIDS, I became much more active in the cannabis community because it was, uh, it was something that people could use. It was a holistic treatment for the symptoms of, uh, of uh, the drugs that we were taking. Right, and that's pretty harsh. And, tha and that actually is the genesis of, of the Brownie Mary, and which is the, you know, she was right. active at that time, yeah. giving out her magic brownies yeah. to, to, to patients at San Francisco General Hospital. And oh, she was allowed to give them out at the hospital? She was giving oh them out cool. there. Also, uh, in, in the Castro, she was giving out her magic brownies. So um, we, became, we were active then. And Dennis Perone, we were active. We went to his dispensary, and he, we were active with him. And then we became politically active in 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 um, ace americans for safe access uh, a bit later on okay. so it's it's been a, it's been an incredible journey okay it sounds like it it sounds like it and again i'm just hearing so many stories we might have to do just a whole podcast with with just the two of you um but before we get into some of the specifics about legalizing medical and then legalizing recreational and some of the other stuff i like to um you know before a lot of my shows when there are topics that i can actually do a little bit of research on i like to go on wikipedia which is about as in-depth as i get and um and just get some facts and just to kind of contextualize th contextualize things a little bit so i just want to read in this case it's mostly going to be historical but um one thing that's not necessarily historical well it is historical but it's it's more recent anyway by 2010, 79% of cannabis nationwide came from California, and that was presumably mostly from the Emerald Triangle, which for those of you who aren't familiar with that is Mendocino, Humboldt, and Trinity, I think is the Emerald Triangle, right? 
Um, but going back further, I just found a lot of this really interesting. So cannabis was cultivated for fiber and rope as early as 1795 in California when cultivation began at Mission San Jose. So I love the fact that the missionaries brought cannabis to the state, first of all. I think that's interesting. Uh, cannabis was grown in several regions of Southern California, with two-thirds of it being grown on the missions. California produced 13,000 pounds of hemp in 1807 and 220,000 pounds three years later in 1810. So hemp was a big deal in the early 1800s. But then Mexico began to rebel against Spain, subsidies for hemp were cut, and then that kind of wiped out hemp except for Russian colonists growing it up at Fort Ross until the 1840s, which again, for those who aren't local, is up north, north of the city. With regards to psychoactive cannabis, among the early cultivators of cannabis for recreational use in California were Arabs, Armenians, and Turks who grew cannabis as early as 1895 to make hash for local consumption. But then the really interesting, I mean, all of that's interesting to me, but something that, that's particularly interesting is then when we start to get into the criminalization, since that, of course, is what we're going to talk about. So much of this conversation will be about decriminalizing. So when did we start criminalizing? Well, the Poison Act, rhetorical question, hold that thought. <laughs> the Poison Act was passed in, first of all, I love that it was called the Poison Act. So in 1907, the Poison Act uh, was passed in California related to pot or cannabis. And in 1913, an amendment was made to make possession of extracts, tinctures, and other narcotic preparations of hemp or loco weed. So first of all, for those who don't speak Spanish, loco, of course, means crazy. So crazy weed. I didn't know uh, cannabis was called that. You guys probably did. Uh, but anyway, their preparations compounds a misdemeanor. There's no evidence that that law was used to restrict pharmaceutical cannabis. 1915, another amendment forbade the sale or possession of flowering tops and leaves, extracts, tinctures, and other narcotic preparations of hemp, uh, with except with a prescription. So 1915, you can still get it with a prescription, which was interesting, again, again to me. And I know you guys probably already know all this. But both bills were drafted and supported by the California State Board of Pharmacy. In 1925, so for context, prohibition was from 1920 to 1933. So in 1925, now we're in this era of prohibition, possession, which had previously been treated the same as distribution, became punishable by up to six years in prison. prison. So now we're starting to get more serious. Black market sale, which had previously been a misdemeanor, publish, uh, punishable by 50 to 100 days in jail, 180 days in jail, became punishable by six months to six years. 1927, the laws designed to target opium were extended to hemp as if, I mean, as if they were, you know, apples to apples. So that, again, was interesting to me. 1929, second offenses for possession became punishable by sentences of six months to ten years. 1937, cannabis became a separate, cultivation became a separate offense. 1954 is when things got really serious. Penalties for marijuana possession were hiked to a minimum of one to 10 years in prison. So in the land of the free, just to have marijuana, a minimum, you had to go to prison for a year, which I didn't know, again, that we were ever had that sort of minimum there. Sale was made, and I'm almost done here. I just think this is so interesting. Hopefully other people do as well. <laughs> sale was made punishable by, this again in 1954, sale was made punishable by a five to 15 years uh, in, in prison with a mandatory three years before eligibility for parole Two prior felonies raised the maximum sentences for both offenses to life imprisonment. So you could go to jail for having pot, uh, cannabis. Sorry, I'm going to do that probably throughout the show, even though I normally say cannabis. Met, uh, meanwhile, people are getting shit-faced in bars. That's actually my – that's not from Wikipedia. That was my own, uh, my own observation. So can you guys tell us a little bit about, you know, what are the origins? Like I said, prohibition – accounts for some of those attitudes from 1920 to 1933, but the, the time that I just covered was much greater than that. What are some of the origins of the demonization and criminalization? Why, you know, again, at, at the same time, most of that time, alcohol was fine. Why, why do you think sociologically we've targeted cannabis as this horrible thing and yet allowed alcohol? Well, after uh, Prohibition failed, they knew that uh, – Prohibition was not a good idea, so they often turned to cannabis. William Anslinger, when Prohibition was repealed in 1933, turned his attention to cannabis. Now, prior to that, when they began to demonize cannabis in the early 1900s, uh, 1910 is when the first law against cannabis was passed in Utah because the Mormon missionaries were bringing it back from Mexico. So again, the missionaries yes. bring it back pot. Yeah. Interesting. And they equated it with opium, and they also 
made references to the fact that it was being used by what they called Hindus, people of dark skin. I saw that. So there was yeah. a, it wasn't the only reason, but it was definitely a component, Racism a racist component. Into it. And in the 30s, Anslinger talked about how white women would be threatened by wild African-American men if they smoked cannabis with them and then had you know unspeakable sexual acts or something oh like goodness. that. So there's a really b a big racist component. There a is racist, a racist yeah. component. It's not the only reason. It may yeah. not be the salient reason why they made it illegal, yeah. but it was one of the reasons that was cited for doing it. And in the 30s, um, people were doing it, but they had to go to s you know special places and secretly you know get it like in Harlem. They were they were they were what they called dope dens, dope joints, where they could do it. And again, I don't like that word, but that's yeah, how they. But at the time, that's what it was. Yeah, called. They also yeah. called it reefer back then. Yep. And in 1937, when it was made illegal federally, the AMA, the American Medical Association, testified against it. But they tried to change the congressional record to read as if they were for prohibition. So it was very disreputable what happened. Okay. So part of uh, the demonization, the criminalization, has been uh, claims that, well, there the benefits that are claimed, if we talk more in a, from a medicinal perspective, haven't actually been proven. Now, I've read, um, besides the fact I know that's not the case, I read specifically your interview in The Dragon in November of last year where you responded to, to that idea of that the, the benefits of medicinal marijuana have not actually been proven. And what, what did you say, say about that? Okay. Or what would you say about that? There is overwhelming evidence that marijuana has medical value, and the latest study done by the Institute of Medicine with Donald Abrams on their steering committee shows that it had, at minimum, substantial effects for improving pain relief, nausea due to chemotherapy, uh, m uh, metabolic disorders like IBD and Crohn's disease. IBD is intestinal bowel. Dis uh, is that what the IBD? Um, no, what's IBD? Irritable, irritable bowel, bowel irritable syndrome. Irritable bowel syndrome. Yeah. Irritable bowel syndrome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Crohn's disease and the spasticity and neuropathy of multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So here's the key. Go to PubMed.gov, which is the government compendium of That's all double bind, yep. of all peer-reviewed government research. And if you type in Adderall for speed, you may get a few hundred hits. Adderall is the speed derivative they give children. Yep. Type in cannabis, you'll get over 26,000 hits. It's the most researched plant on the planet. And it, cannabis is not just one chemical. It's not just THC. There are about 100 cannabinoids, which are bioflavonoids unique to the cannabis plant, plus 400 more chemicals, including terpenes, which are found in all plants. Terpenes are fragrance molecules that give all plants their flavor and taste. And cannabis has a unique terpene that's only in cannabis. And there are many other terpenes in cannabis that are shared with other plants, like pinene, limonene, linalool, myrcene, beta carophylline. These are all in other plants as well. Not every plant. They share them with some plants. So cannabis plants that smell of pine have pinene in them just the way pine needles have pinene oh in them. Oh, really? Interesting. Yes. Well, you know, I actually, um, I helped a, a friend who was who was growing up in Mendocino, and so I actually, you know, saw saw the plants outdoors. These were outdoor plants, and I was struck by first of all how good they smelled, and and I know that pot itself or marijuana or cannabis smells good often depending on on, on the kind, but the plants smelled over the top. I mean, they smelled so good. But furthermore, each of them smelled really, really differently. Which is what, which, which, uh, which is why I was just reminded of that. You know, you're talking about some have pine needles, some have. So the the, the variety that each strain, I guess, is the is the correct term, and and so there, are, uh, how many strains are there even? I mean, they're just that's just kind of a random question, but there are thousands. Thousands, yeah. What yeah. we're really concerned about is maintaining the land race strains, the ones that are unique to particular climates, like lamb's bread from Jamaica, Durban poison, and it's not a poison. It's a strain from South Africa, and the reason it's called Durban poison is that they tried to poison it, but it survived. Uh, so it wears the word poison as a badge of honor right, that it survived right, right. An, an attempt. Right. So you D Dr. Say? Ethan Russo from the University of Washington has, has done a, a lot of work on the, on the terpenes and the effect of the terpenes. And he, it's amazing. It's amazing. He, he went to a conference in, in Berkeley um, last year, and he was at the conference, and he spoke about 
the effect, and he th he's able to tell you what the effect from the terpenes will be in, in terms of therapeutic use. Mm -hmm. And this has actually been proven out with with the, with with the, the, the patients have reported back that it exactly as he had predicted what the terpenes would do, the the, the effect on the patient was was the same. Okay. And so we did just mention some of the benefits. Um, I'm just going to list some more that I saw because so initially, uh, Assembly Bill 1529 approved cannabis for uh, AIDS, cancer, glaucoma, multiple sclerosis. I think you just mentioned all of those. But then Prop 215, which of course came later, uh, covered or it specifically called out the benefits for cancer, anorexia, AIDS, chronic pain, spasticity, glaucoma, arthritis, migraine, and quite frankly, any, and uh, not quite frankly, but quote, any other illness for which marijuana provides relief. So again, lots of, lots of benefits here, and we could talk more about that. But in the interest of time, paying attention to the clock here, I would like to move on to medical legalization. So can you tell us just a little bit about the history of how that came about here in California? It came out of the AIDS movement. Dennis Perone wanted cannabis for his partner at the time who was sick with HIV. Brownie Mary was baking marijuana-infused brownies for the AIDS patients at Ward 86 at SF General Hospital. And then in 1991, President George H.W. Bush ended the investigational new drug program for marijuana because so many people with HIV were asking to join it. And he said, you should just use Marinol, the synthetic THC in a pill, which is not the same thing as the whole plant itself. It's like comparing a vitamin C pill with an orange and thinking they're equivalent. It's ridiculous. Yep. And then, but it seems part of it also, so that's kind of how it got started, uh, or not kind of, that's how it got started. But then another thing that I had forgotten about, and I remembered when I was looking, uh, doing some of the research for today's show, is there was sort of a step-by-step -step thing whereby we started, um, what was it, decriminal, or making it, City Board of Supervisors passed resolution in August 92, 1992, urging the police commission and district attorney to make the lowest priority the arrest or prosecution for those involved. So that was a way of not quite delegalizing yet because we couldn't, but making it available again so that the AIDS patients could, we could get it to the AIDS patients without people being worried about being prosecuted. So that was a big step in getting in, in the right direction, right? Yes, Prop P was passed in the early 90s, which made marijuana law enforcement, San Francisco's police department lowest priority. Unfortunately, every time there's a new police chief in San Francisco, they have to be reminded of that policy. Yeah. So it's there's some subjectivity there and yes. open to some some interpretation right. depending upon their motives yes. and beliefs. Yeah, depending a lot. Yeah. Okay. I think Prop sixty four has done a lot to help remove some of the issues, but Prop sixty four created more issues as well. It's a double edged sword. Okay. Um you what you want to say something? Yeah. 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 Prop two sixteen is now what, twenty two years ago. I know. I couldn't believe how long ago. Yeah. It, 22 years ago now, yeah, San Francisco, the politics on cannabis at that time were, were progressive. We, we had a progressive board, and um, a Prop 64 just really messed it up. Mm -hmm. It just uh, really threw a, 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 a wrench in, 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 the, um, in, in, the in the cannabis movement, and we were going along really well with, with medical cannabis, I, th I think we should have continued to, okay, to so continue uh, moving forward on that. I'm sorry. Can you remind me which one was 64? Prop 64 was the legalization for personal use passed in 2016. Oh, so we're talking about the, the, the most recent yeah, one the right, for right. recreational. Yeah. Okay, yeah. As much as I want d you know, complete decriminalization and legalization for personal use, there are regulations that the legislature have enacted and there are provisions in Prop 64 that need work. So th this is a work in progress. Okay. We made like I would I like to say we've made two steps forward and one step back when we passed Prop 64. Okay. Can we hold that thought just because I, I definitely want to talk about 64 and the the recreational, but I would I, I don't want to get away from the medical quite yet because I have a couple other questions about that. So, um, so we started by you know the city board of supervisors saying hey let's move in this direction let's let the AIDS patients have access to it and we started inching towards it towards legalization of medical. But still, there were lots of challenges in the way at the time. How were we able, how were you able, you and the other people that you were working with, what, how were you able to get over that hurdle so that we were actually able to legalize medical at the time? Well, we got help in getting an initiative on the ballot in, t in 1996. 
And because our initiative got to the registrar of voters hours before a more conservative initiative that would have been highly more uh, restrictive, interesting. we got 215 on the ballot first. Thanks for and hustling. And so after we got it on the ballot, we had money to spend from professional organizations to run a professional campaign. And it passed, I believe, with 50, 54% to 46 or 55, 45 back in 1996. Mm -hmm. And it passed overwhelmingly in San Francisco. And at the time, it was just because, I mean, the, the I'm just curious, what was the result of its success was just because societal opinions about this had changed enough? It was just the timing was right? I think the fact that we were in the midst of an AIDS crisis and it was just before protease inhibitors were hitting the scene, people were still dying in great numbers, and cannabis really helped, that that helped propel interest in seeing it as a medical, as a medical, having medical yeah, value. that people could see. Yeah, please. Yeah, I just want to add that it even passed in Chinatown. Okay, which I we're going to get to a little amount, later. Which yeah. is kind of interesting because that w where we are today with the uh, moratorium in Chinatown. Yeah, so hold that thought because so we're going to talk um, about that. Yeah, yeah we've... But that just shows how broad the support was. It was, it was across yeah. the board. Yeah. And that was, there was a, a lot of energy to, to make this happen. And uh, uh, Dennis Perone was 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 the was the uh, the match that that led it and, and really has got it going he, he you know he's he's passed on now but we we have we ha we have a lot to thank him for okay all right so that's medical and again of course we could talk much 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 more about that but now let's let's move on to recreational and the first question i have is you know uh california was the first to legalize medical but we were not the first to, recre uh, to legalize recreational. Now, we tried in 2010, but it got rejected. So, uh, and the first recreational states were Colorado and Washington in November of 2012. So I'm just curious, why were we the first with medical, but why was there this resistance to recreational? I don't know if I would call it resistance. Mm -hmm. It was just a matter of getting medical well-established. By the time we passed Prop 64 in 2016, we had a vibrant medical cannabis uh, culture throughout the state and especially in San Francisco. And in San Francisco, prior to 2011, when Melinda Haig as the U.S. Attorney clamped down on dispensaries under the Obama administration, we had a lot of dispensaries. We had about eight or nine consumption lounges that were part of dispensaries where you could legally go and consume it if you were a medical patient. And that meant that you could go to a dispensary and you could find what you needed. They had different strains for different effects because of the different chemical composition. All strains are rather different from each other. Some are medically good for some things, some are medically good for other things. And it's all based on the biochemistry of the plant. But how are you saying that that was impacting the recreational not getting you're saying the medical was strong and anyone and anyone, and anyone who was 18 or over could find a cannabis you know cannabis friendly physician who could write them a recommendation oh because in other words people who wanted to use it recreationally could, could go get through it the medical medically. channel and but so i didn't but i don't know how many people were doing that yeah there's no way to know yeah and i'm not going to second guess what a person tells their physician about why they need it. And if they need it for insomnia or for pain relief rather than wanting to take an aspirin or some sleep drug from, you know, insomnia, anti-insomnia drug from the pharmaceutical industry, I'm not going to say that that's an invalid reason. Right. That's perfectly valid. Cannabis has far fewer side effects than most traditional prescription medications. In fact, 80% of medical cannabis use in 2011 was shown to be by people replacing suboptimal or ineffective prescription drugs. Yeah, well that I can believe. Yeah. yeah. When, when you go to your doctor's office and you see people in his office, do you say to those yourself, oh, those people don't look sick. They're just here to get the Vicodin. That's all they well, want. Well, it depends on the person. Sometimes I do. But they don't. Yeah. Most people <laughs> in the office do not look sick. Right. They're right. not. But you they don't are. Know. Right. You can't just tell are. just by looking. You by can't someone. tell by just looking right. at somebody. Right. So that's what we're asking. Yeah, so one thing that, that did surprise me, though, at the time when we were voting the first recreational legislation and then it got turned down, one thing that really surprised me, because at the time I was spending a fair amount of time up in Mendocino, and I was surprised by how many of the, the smaller growers were actually against legalizing recreational. So what about that threat? Were you guys surprised that um, so many of them, what, what, what were your thoughts on, on that? They were afraid that they would be put out of business by burdensome regulations. Right. 
and and big corporate and big farmer farming. coming in yep. or big tobacco coming in or just big money coming in trying to you know squeeze them out and as a result of prop 64 we're seeing a lot of that over half the growers from the California Growers Association are no longer in business we really believe spend because that of the onerous fi- uh, fees and regulations that legalization has brought now it came in two parts right before prop 64 passed to legalize for adult personal use the California legislature passed a bill which is now in its latest incarnation called MOCRISA, the Medical Adult Use and uh, Medical and Adult Use uh, Cannabis uh, Regulation and Safety Act. Mm-hmm. And MOCRISA put a lot of onerous regulations down that were mirrored in Prop 64 for the adult use population. So we have medical. Now getting some very restrictive regulations with MOCRISA, followed by Prop 64 the same year, 2016, legalizing for adult personal use. We had an, 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 an initiative to go in 2016 called the CRTA rather than AUMA, the one that passed. But at the last minute, Justin Hartfield of Weed Maps and the Marifa- Marijuana Policy Project reneged on a promise to give us two million dollars to get our grassroots initiative that we had worked on for two years in writing and went with a more conservative initiative that Sean uh, Parker promoted with his attorneys because they wanted it to pass with a higher percentage. Okay. So we, a lot of us grinned and bared it when we voted for Prop 64. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Michael? I s- the uh, California reform uh, uh, ballot initiative that we had was really thought out and looked at carefully. It had been vetted uh, down in Southern California in L.A., uh, through here uh, with the growers in, in Northern California. And so through you were trying to involve the Emerald them and make sure they were part we of the We brought people process. in yeah. to put that Reform Act together. And w- it was actually a, a, a well thought out, and it was actually very well supported. But we got we got snookered at the very end. Yeah, is there anything being done today to protect the smaller growers, or is it just the tide has sort of turned and anyone who can get into the game is getting into the game? And if you can't hold your own, here's you're kind the problem of with Macrissa and Prop 64. To get a state license, you must get a local authorization, which normally means a local license. Some localities are making it very difficult for people to get licenses. Okay, and that's and then they're kind of favoring the larger. Or they're not allowing any of it, any commercial operation. They don't have to. Their consequence, if they don't allow any commercial cannabis uh, production in their county, they can't get any of the money that comes through Prop 64's taxes. Ah, interesting. So eventually they may see the light and decide that the money is worth going after. Money talks. But we're seeing much higher prices now because of all the taxes that have been imposed under Mokrissa and Prop 64. We're seeing a larger black market than ever before. And we're seeing people who are giving up on going to legitimate dispensaries and going back to the black market. So there are some there are some 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 problems post recter- post legalizing recreation that we've gotta figure out. We we Michael. have the warning signs already, and that is the first quarter of this year, the revenues for the state of California from cannabis f- cannabis taxes was only thirty percent of what they had e- expected for the state of Cal- in the state of California interesting interesting so okay. th- uh, uh, the canary in the coal mine is I- you know we're get we're getting canary the message already over. yeah okay so uh, stay tuned okay stay tuned quickly and then I want to move on from this because we've got some other things but go ahead David yeah. okay right now in San Francisco most people are paying 59 percent in taxes mm-hmm. around nine percent sales tax 15% statewide excise tax on retail sales of cannabis, 25% testing fee, and a 10% cultivation tax. Wow. And the city is now promoting Proposition D through a ballot initiative. Well, not the city, but certain supervisors are. And we're vehemently opposing the cannabis tax proposed in Proposition D. Okay, we're going to talk about that, that at the end because that, that sounds uh, very important and very timely. But before we wrap up, though, th- with the uh, with the medical, I want to just say that, first of all, I was really uh, – sorry, not the medical, with the recreational. I was really surprised to see that the first attempt wasn't in the 90s. The first attempt to actually legalize recreational was in 1972. So that's just kind of a random fact that I found that was very surprising to me. Um, 
but then um, uh, so we talked about the megaphone. Th the other question I had before we move on, I because I want to ask you about federal and the fact that the states are legalizing, but the federal government at the federal level, of course, it's still illegal. Uh, but uh, one question I have, is California still a leader in the legalization or these other states that legalized recreational before us, have they kind of taken, taken the reins? Well, I would say that taxes are much more friendly to the consumer, whether they're a patient or an adult consumer in Oregon. Oregon lowered their medical cannabis tax to zero. So if you're a medical patient oh with a valid recommendation in Oregon, you pay no tax. Interesting. And the maximum tax in Oregon for adult personal sales is between 17 and 20 percent. It's at least 17 percent, and local counties can and cities can add up to 3 percent. When they lowered their taxes to these low levels, zero for medical, 17 to 20 for adult personal use, their sales volumed up by 1500 percent that more than compensated yeah. them for they made so much offset. more in taxes because the sales were greater right. than they were making with higher taxes and lower sales right michael you had something there yes i saw the you get the excited demand over there. the yeah. demand for 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 cannabis for flour is is elastic meaning if you drop the taxes on it you're going to get a huge increase in, in demand sure. for it sure. and that's exactly what happened in colorado and it's also happened in, uh, in, in Washington, and it's also happened in Colorado. And I dare say we're going to see the same thing here in California, and we're already beginning to see uh, an opening on that. So and so I think the answer to my, my question, it sounds like, is California is no longer necessarily kind of on the in the lead on a lot of these issues, and it's largely because of these tax issues, exactly. is what I think I'm hearing yes. you say. Interesting. Yes. Okay, so, so the question that I just mentioned a second ago, again, this is one that has really interested me, you know, since the states began legalizing both medicinal and recreational uh, cannabis is, is just this, this contradiction or this, this battle between the states and the federal government. And as you pointed out, David, even under Obama, who around here is sometimes seen as this progressive, you know, hero, the reality is even under Obama, the, the, the dispensaries were getting shut down and raided, right? So it's not even just a question of Republicans and Democrats, progressive versus not. So it's, it's federal versus states. So in 2018, where we are today, even though I haven't heard a lot about you know dispensaries being raided and things, and it seems as if things are better, but is there still this constant threat or, uh, or no? Yes, there is a better? threat. We believe that the Rohrbacher Blumenauer Amendment was reenacted when the continuing resolution on the budget in Congress went through on September 30th. And what that amendment does is that it prevents the Department of Justice from spending any money to interdict medical cannabis in states that have a robust regulatory structure. It doesn't protect adult use, but the junior senator from Colorado, Cory Gardner, a Republican, insisted that the Department of Justice not go after the adult personal use well-regulated market in Colorado and said that I will not allow any nominee for the Justice Department's bureaucracy to go through the Senate until we have assurances from Attorney General Sessions that they will leave Colorado's robust, well-regulated adult personal use market alone. And he got that. But that could go at any point. It's believed that Trump will fire sessions after the midterm elections. They don't and seem it to looks be like along Lindsey so well Graham today. is yeah. angling to become attorney general the way he's become so uh, subservient to Trump and re replicating his style in the Senate on the Kavanaugh nomination. So the threat is always there. Mm -hmm. There's a conflict between federal and state law. Over 30 states have legalized medical cannabis. Nine states have legalized adult personal use. And anytime the government wanted to go in and interdict adult personal use, they can do it. They can't go after medical. Now, what they've been doing, which is quite clever, is they're going after the non-regulated illegal operations like in Sacramento. They found a bunch of Chinese folks running grow ops in the Sacramento area, and they're not regulated under state law. They weren't compliant under state law, and so there's per they have perfect rights under our federal law to go after them. I think it's a waste of time and money, but 
That's what's happened. They're going after what I call the low-hanging fruit, the people that are not compliant under state law, under the state, under the, you know, the many states' legal medical regulatory right, system. Right. So what about um, – so that's interesting because I didn't realize until I was preparing for today that there had been that legislation at the federal level saying, okay, we're not legalizing it, but we are saying leave it alone. I didn't realize it actually been legislation. I knew there was policy to that effect. So, so that was interesting, but like you said – who knows that could that c that could change? But the other question I had with regards to the federal level is um, financing. I hear that because so much of our banking system is regulated federally, that dispensaries and cannabis operations have trouble getting financing and things like that. Is that true? They have some trouble getting banks to do their electronic, you know, transfers, credit cards, things like that. But some dispensaries have found banks that are willing to do it. Okay. Bank of Marin is willing to do it oh yeah? for large clients. Interesting. Yeah, there okay. are a few banks that are doing it. It's just beginning, but many of them are scared because if they take money from a controlled substance under federal law, they could have their charter revoked. Right. So they are technically doing it, but they're doing it at their own risk. And being careful about right. it. Right. And, yeah. and the other issue is the 280E exemption. Normal businesses get to exempt their business expenses uh, from income tax. But cannabis businesses cannot deduct their business expenses because, again, they're selling under federal law a controlled substance, a Schedule One drug, no medical value, highest potential for abuse, as it's characterized. Yep. Compare that with Marinol, Schedule Three, which is synthetic THC in a sesame oil pill, and the new drug, Epidiolex, a CBD spray for children primarily with seizure disorders, which has just been reclassified as Schedule Five, which is where you know penicillin is. Okay. All right. Well, now my head's spinning because there were a lot of schedules in there, but um, but yeah, I get I get the overall point that that there's a lot of hypocrisy and inconsistency and all of that with regards to how these how cannabis is being treated at the federal level. But again, in the interest of, in the interest of time, um, I want to move on and, and for the what remains of the show, I want to split it kind of into two sections. One is uh, sort of broad issues again, current facing cannabis currently, and then some specific political topics that are more local to California that um, some things that Governor Brown has just done. So, but with regards to the broad issues, um, you, I think you were both involved with Americans for Safe Access, or you both were, right? Yeah. So it says, uh, first of all, can you tell us, M Michael, can you tell me uh, what Americans for Safe Access is? And then the reason I bring this organization back up is because I thought it was really interesting when I was reading about them uh, on their website, what safe access means because I think it plays into a lot of people who are against cannabis it really kind of speaks to a lot of their concerns and there is and it was interesting to see that you're very deliberately looking to address those concerns and make it safe for everyone so can you tell us first just quickly what the organization is yes sure ACE is, a na is, is stands for Americans for Safe Access and it's a, a it's a national organization it has many chapters uh, across uh, across the country including here in San Francisco. And it, it, b it believes and its, its focus is, is primarily on, on, uh, on cannabis a, 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 as medicine. Mm -hmm. And it, it uh, ha always has been for, for ASA and it continues to this day. They have, some lo they have a, a, a lobbyist in, in, um, in Washington, D.C. Um, and uh, we um, uh, Support it totally. We were we were in it for about five years. We ran the, the, the San Francisco chapter, so I mean, there's been a, there's been a lot of a lot of political activity, and uh, we use we educate people. Uh, uh, we'd have about 50, 50 to sixty people at a, at a, at meetings. We meet twice a month here okay. in San Francisco. So so what is what does safe access mean? Because that this again was to me what was really interesting here about the safe the access means safe and affordable access where you can go to a dispensary and buy high-quality laboratory-tested medicine that's free of mold, pesticide, fungus, bacteria, growth uptake inhibitors, radiation, and know its chemical composition, how potent it is when you're buying edibles, knowing how many milligrams of THC, other chemicals of interest in the plant are CBD, CBN, CBG, THCV, these all have different and potent medical values, and it's important for patients to have access and the knowledge to know what, what they're buying has these particular chemicals in which amounts and which dosages right. to keep it medical. And we want it affordable. We want prices reasonable. Again, 80% of us use medical cannabis to get off suboptimal or ineffective prescription drugs. 
Prescription drugs at the pharmacy pay no tax at all. Most likely you're not paying more than a $20 copayment on your insurance. Cannabis can't be insured by insurance companies because of the federal prohibition. Well, that was the other thing I was going to say. Right. That was, right. And, in ca- and right now, when we go to a dispensary, the prices have gone up 59% since January. Yeah, since legalization. Yep. So one point, we have over, t- over 200 different cities in, in California here that have a moratorium on cannabis. The oh, really? Complete moratorium on cannabis. The only access that would be available to these people in these areas would be would be uh, delivery services. Mm-hmm. And and that's fraught with issues. It's also very expensive. So, so cities still have the, uh, the option of saying, we don't want cannabis. Cities can decide that at that they level. They have the final say. Interesting. Okay. Uh, so let me just go through really quickly here just from the website. I think, David, I think you covered all this. But again, it was so interesting. I just want to run down this. Uh, inter- so what does a safe access mean per the website? International, federal, state laws, and regular... Regulations recognize cannabis as legal medicine. Medical professionals recommend medical cannabis options as frontline treatment. Patients and their caregivers have the information they need. We talked about that. Um, da, 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 uh, trusting the label, she mentioned that. And then, yeah, covered by insurance. So I just want to make sure we covered all that because it's very interesting to me. Okay. The other thing um, in this sort of category of, of, of this part of our conversation, another organization with which you work but you were also – or have worked, but you were – you are president still – I the am uh, the president, and Michael is the secretary. Okay. On the le- we're both on the leadership team of the Brownie Mary Democratic Club, yeah. which we formed in 2014 to be a democratic club that's chartered by the city and through the state, and we focus on cannabis law reform, improving the access for both medical and adult use, adult personal use, and at the same time reforming the laws both locally statewide and federally and we have a lot of work to do okay and the reason the reason i bring this organization up again is because of something i found on on this website which is quote whether it's bans homes being raided duis or children being taken away from their parents all of these problems are a result of politicians failing to enact any regulations and have instead created an unbridled profusion of unregulated unlicensed medical marijuana collectives do those things that i just mentioned still happen post medicinal uh, legislation and post recreational, or is some of that kind of a carryover from before this more recent legislation? That's a carryover from the okay, past. Okay, that's what I was hoping. Now with Mocrisa and Prop yeah. 64 and a bunch of legislation that's been passed this year and the previous year, we now have a regulatory structure in California. But again, 200 cities and counties have no access at all. Yeah. And a, and a bill to allow deliveries into unfriendly counties from friendly counties was defeated in the legislature. In fact, some people in the cannabis industry down in Southern California and the UFCW and the League of Cities, which is the lobbying group of city governments in Sacramento, opposed the bill. So they're basically telling people, you may have to drive 50 to 100 miles to get legal cannabis. Can you imagine having to drive 50 to 100 miles to go to a drugstore to get your penicillin? Not ideal. Not ideal. But that's a, a great segue to legislation. So let's talk about some of the recent legislation or upcoming legislation. And specifically, David, you already mentioned earlier, and thank you for letting me put the brakes on that earlier, Proposition D. So what is Proposition D, and how do you feel about Proposition D? Proposition D is a ballot initiative put by put on the board uh, put on the ballot in San Francisco for San Francisco voters only. Okay. It will be on the November 6th ballot. It is an additional special gross receipts tax on cannabis businesses, which is up to 50 times higher than comparable businesses that are not related to cannabis. It also taxes medical cannabis cultivators, medical cannabis manufacturers that make topicals, tinctures, edibles, cartridges, suppositories, and it also taxes medical cannabis distributors. So medical cannabis patients may see up to a 7% increase in their prices, according to the Green Cross's accountant, the Green Cross is a dispensary in the city that has analyzed the impact of these hidden medical taxes in there. So and I there's also a tax on adult per com- retail sales that's 50 times higher than retail sales of any other product in the city. Okay, so, so that's my question. So we understand, I think that a lot of the reason that this, that, that cannabis was legalized was because a lot of people who might not even want to partake uh, recognized that the, the tax benefits that this would bring. 
But what about the way you're describing it? And I this is the first I've actually heard of this. I haven't done my research on this yet. But the way you're describing it, it's so disproportionate. So there's one thing to tax it just because we know that that's going to help the state at a, at a reasonable rate. That's one thing. What the so the people that are uh, putting this forth, w they must have some rationale for why th this rate is justified. What's their because they can because they can. It's it oh, will Michael's give grabbing at the mic. Michael's okay. got something to I'll say. I'll just on this. say something <laughs> really quickly. Uh -huh. They estimate Supervisor Cohen, the pr the president of the board of supervisors, spearheaded this, and she got a total of eight supervisors, including herself, out of eleven, to vote to put it on the ballot. It takes four. They got eight, and it is putative. We talked to her at the finance committee's hearings on it, and we told them that we're okay paying gross receipts tax on an equitable basis with other comparable non-cannabis businesses. Right. Parity. Right, right. But to tax us up to 50 times higher than any other business in the city is outrageous. In fact, the way gross receipts tax works is that there are different tiers. Tier one, the lowest tier, is for retailing operations. Tier two is for manufacturing, up to about tier six or seven, which is construction. And the highest rate any other business would pays on gross receipts taxes 0.56%. Cannabis taxes will be as high as 5%. Now, a regular retailing only pays around one-tenth of a percent. Cannabis adult use retailing, 5%. That's 50 times right, higher. Right, right. To give you an example, if a non-cannabis retail business makes $2 million in gross receipts, they pay $1,750 in gross receipts tax. A cannabis adult use retail entity that makes two million in gross receipts will right. pay sixty two thousand five hundred. Right. So it's it's completely disproportionate. Uh, and from your perspective again, and then and then I want to talk about Chinatown, but from your perspective, and of course we don't have someone from the other side here, uh, but from your perspective it's just because they can. Because there's people who are Oh, they're fighting over the mic again. They're fighting over the mic. There's a lot of passion on the other side of the table here. Michael, I think if you hold on to that tightly enough, y you can say something now. So wha wha what would you like to say about that? I wanted to say that this is a new industry. Yeah. This is we, – we just we just passed Prop 64, what, a, y a, year, and a, a year and a half ago. And it just came into effect. And it just came into effect. Less than a year. This is right. a new industry. Right. If we had treated the tech industry – when it came to San Francisco, the way we're treating the cannabis industry today, I doubt whether we would have a very a very vibrant tech industry in San Francisco today. Yep. The, the cannabis industry needs to get its feet under itself and to develop some stability. Okay. Uh, any new industry has to do that. Yeah. We haven't done that yet. Yeah. And uh, my point is, adding new taxes, the gross receipts ta tax, particularly one. Um, I'm not against gross receipts taxes, but I'm against very unfair of this proportion. Of this right. proportion. Right. And uh, let's let's and let's get some uh, some uh, data and some data points on on taxes and and et cetera in here in San Francisco. All right. Fair enough. Just to say one point. Yeah. Cannabis businesses are paying the normal rates for gross receipts right now. This would change that and make them up to 50 times higher. Right. So it's not right. like we're not paying our gross receipts no, no, no. tax Got at it. the moment. Got it. You guys don't have an issue with paying taxes. You have an issue with paying this disproportionate, in your perspective, disproportionate amount. It's, a, it's almost like a sin tax. Right. Okay. Parity. Okay. Let's go for parity. That, that sounds right. Again, given what little I know about this, that sounds right to me. But let's move on. In the interest of time, Chinatown. Chinatown doesn't want any dispensaries. And there's uh, there's legislation that's being put forth for that, I think, as well. The legislation was already passed. It was already passed. On oh July 31st, that. the Board of Supervisors, by a vote of 8 to 3, and the only three votes against it were Valley Brown, Raphael Mandelman, and Hillary Ronan. Those were the three votes against it. They banned all cannabis businesses, not just retail dispensaries, but cultivation, manufacturing, distribution. Any cannabis business is now banned in Chinatown. It's a horrible precedent. And what's, the, what's the fear here? What's the fear? The Chinese community has been told by their parents and great-grandparents and, and grandparents and great-grandparents about the opium wars mm. in the 1800s oh, so in China and how the British used opium to enslave a population ah, so to an cultural. evil drug. And so there's a conflation between cannabis and other harmful opiates like Interesting. opium. Interesting. And there's a lot of ignorance, and it's ironic because ch cannabis was in the Chinese pharmacopoeia thousands of years ago. Right, right, right. And, and every other store is an herbal right. store in, in Chinatown. Yeah. But more importantly, yeah. let's talk about fact-based and evidence-based analysis. 
there is no evidence that cannabis related businesses either the customers of these businesses or the employees do bad things to neighborhoods you go to comp stat which is the police database of crimes in san francisco and you do not find that cannabis businesses whether they're dispensaries or cultivation centers or manufacturing centers or distribution centers harm neighborhoods there's no evidence to support that and to say that i as a patient I'm not fit to go to Chinatown to buy cannabis medicine, but I am fit to go to a restaurant or to a store there to buy something that's non-cannabis related is absurd. Well, one thing that really su didn't surprise me, but one thing that was interesting once we did get the, the legalization, first medicinally and then recreationally, was you go to the apothecarium just for example. I mean, that's much nicer than my apartment. I mean, some of these places, are many of these places are really, really nice facilities, right? Yeah. And so I haven't seen, and maybe they're out there, but I haven't walked by a lot of dispensaries and thought, oh, my God, you know, that looks like a dangerous. It's not like um, so. So I don't know. So that's interesting. But I think your point about tying it back historically and culturally is a really, really interesting one. But let's move on, um, because, again, in the interest of time, and I know this is also something that happened very recently, just this week, just maybe two days ago, Governor Brown approved and vetoed a bunch of legislation, not just cannabis related, but but. Oh, they're getting out their notes here. He's got his notes. Um, I okay. regret that I have to use notes. <laughs> I've been memorizing this because there's the voluminous number of bills. There, there is. There okay. is. So the most important bill, in my humble opinion, that yeah. passed was and signed by the governor was AB 1793 by Bonta, which automatically expunges and resentences past marijuana convictions. I saw that one. Yep. So yep. Th it started in San Francisco with D.A. Gascon using a, uh, a proprietary software to look back to people as back as 1975 to look for prior marijuana convictions that could be expunged or lowered from misdemeanor from felonies to misdemeanors or misdemeanors to you know you know excused and that's important because it keeps people from getting employment when they have a criminal record and if they oh can have yeah. their record expunged they don't have to say have you ever been convicted of a crime no right 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 oh uh, let me continue Interesting that it goes so far back okay yes yeah, so that's a good one okay Senate Bill 1409 facilitates cul cultivation of industrial hemp. AB 2215 was signed to allow veterinarians to discuss cannabis with pet owners. Okay, wait, stop. I'm sorry, because that's an interesting one, and that's one I wanted to talk about. So uh, why why would we prevent vets from, from talking about that? I mean, you know, we're talking about, I mean, why can't a dog, so th w they were legally prohibited from saying you might want to give your pet cannabis until this law was passed? Is that what we're Correct. saying? Correct. And what was changes it yeah well um, again i don't know why people do I guess what they do. you'll have to ask yeah. them why <laughs> they do it i'm not going to I mean, it's just i'm yeah. not going to try to guess what's in people's minds when right, they fair when enough when they deal fair with enough. ignorance i was just really surprised okay. that pet owners weren't al anyway i'm not going right. to read them all i'm going to read the ones that i think are really the, the important highlights. to your sure. viewers sure assembly bill 2402 prohibits a cannabis licensee from disclosing a customer's personal information Good, good. AB 12, Senate Bill 1294 establishes a statewide equity program for cannabis businesses to allow equity applicants um, assistance in getting into the uh, cannabis business. Now, equity applicants are often people who've been victims of the cannabis drug war or people of low income, people who've lived in California for quite a while. Uh, there are several qualifications to be called an equity applicant. This law sets up a statewide program rather than just ones that are being set up in individual cities and counties. And this goes to one of the points we were talking about earlier with regards to getting financing and how that, that can be challenging at times. That's, that's what that's related to, Assembly right? Assembly Bill 2721 allows individuals to test their homegrown cannabis at a testing lab. A very important bill, AB 2020, expands the venues from just county fairgrounds where temporary cannabis events can get permits to have events. Oh, before you could only have events related to cannabis on fairgrounds? Correct. Interesting. Didn't realize that. Um, let's see. I'm just looking at the ones uh, that are important. AB 1741 allows for electronic funds transfer of cannabis taxes that's statewide. The, yeah, that's the financing one. Yep. Um, what about some of the ones you're not so happy about? Let's, Because those, those are ones that presumably, I'm assuming, you're mostly uh, – happy with what about some of the the vetoes that you were not so happy okay, with? okay here's one we like we didn't like that pass is one that prohibits alcohol licensees from serving cannabis or alcohol beverages containing cannabinoids there's this paranoid fear that if a venue that sells alcohol also has cannabis that it will somehow turn people into raving maniacs who will run around and 
drive badly. Or and you don't think you know, that'll happen? No, it's, it hasn't happened before, and it's okay. not happening now. Okay. Now, we did get some unfortunate vetoes, and I want to start with Senate Bill 829, the Compassion Bill by Senator Weiner. It would have set up a compassion program where people could donate cannabis to needy patients at little or no cost. And so we are very upset about that. My husband, Michael, and I can talk about that we ran a cannabis compassion program in our home. Yes, we've had a compassion program in our home for years. We invite probably about 20, 20 ish uh, or so people to our home, and we provide enough cannabis, good quality cannabis, to them for uh, maybe four or five months, enough that th will last them. And it's, it's, it's not the the very best, but it's real. It's good quality. So why did uh, why did the governor veto that particular? Because that sounds like a good idea. What was his rationale for vetoing? He th he said it conflicted Oops. with Prop sixty four. Okay, and that's a mistake. The intents and purposes of Prop sixty four do not address medical cannabis for compassionate use, which is what AB Senate Bill A twenty nine addressed. It only ad it, um, the intents and purposes of Prop sixty four leave Prop two fifteen intact which allowed for compassionate programs. Okay. In fact, Prop 15 was called the Compassionate Use Act, CUA. And as a result, uh, we're very upset with the governor for that. Okay, different um, interpretations there. Yes. So he what's another one he vetoed? He vetoed, vetoed Senate Bill 1127 about? to allow parents to give their children medical cannabis on school grounds, saying it was overly broad and that it wasn't just limited to children with seizures, which is ridiculous because they give children with autism very low doses of THC, and it turns those kids into normal children. So there are other issues that children have besides seizures that would require them to have medical cannabis under a doctor's supervision with their parents' approval and to deny them the right to take it at school, the nurse's office, in a form of a tincture, not smoking it or vaping it, but yeah. generally it's an oral tincture under the tongue for a little child. He's not sharing it with anybody. I mean, the governor is just very misguided on that. Okay. Um, he vetoed a bill, AB 1863, to allow licensed commercial cannabis businesses to deduct their business expenses under state personal income tax law. Um, and what was his rationale for that? I don't know. You'll have to know. ask the governor. Ask I'm the sure governor. I'll have him on next week. I haven't. Have him on next. Week. I haven't memorized or written down all his veto messages yeah. on some of these things. Yeah. Um, Okay, so those are some of the those highlights. Are the yeah, those, those are, are the I highlights. Those yeah, are the, the main ones. Those are the major ones. Okay. Well and they were the one that really hurts us is the one that fail, failed to advance and didn't even get passed by the legislature, so the governor couldn't either sign it or veto it or let it become law without a signature. And that was the bill to allow for deliveries of retail cannabis for medical patients into cities and counties that have no that retail don't have access. The access. Yeah. So that was your biggest. Yeah. Okay, so we have time for one more issue here, and that's the Proposition 64, which I think is a local San Francisco issue that you had, you had mentioned. Yes. Under Prop 64, there is a provision to allow for people to get the state medical marijuana ID card in addition to their doctor's recommendation. Here's how this works. When you get your recommendation from your physician, you have 30 days if you so desire to get the optional, I repeat optional, state medical marijuana ID card. Why do you want to get that? Because it exempts you from the n nearly 9% sales tax, and it also gives you a presumption against arrest. If you're caught with more than an mm -hmm. ounce mm -hmm. and you're a medical patient, a cop or law enforcement officer does not have to check a card from a doctor's office or a piece of paperwork from a doctor's office. But if you have the state medical marijuana card in addition, they have to check it. Okay. So it gives you a presumption against arrest. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. very important. Sure. This card costs $100 a year for normal income people, $50 a year for people on Medi-Cal or Medicare, and it's supposed to be $0 for indigent people, and it's in the initiative. But both the San Francisco Department of Public Health and the Sacramento Department of Public Health are defying state law by not allowing indigent people to get it for free. Now, the law under Prop 64 allows the cities and counties to absorb these costs by, re by getting reimbursement from the state under the revenues of Prop 64. So suppose it costs them, let's say, $100 to process an application for an indigent person, just hypothetically that amount. Sure, yeah. They can apply to get a full reimbursement of that $100 from the money that's coming in under Prop 64. But for some reason, the San Francisco Department of Public Health is defying Prop 64 
and not allowing indigent folks, and there are standard vetted criteria for being indigent in San right, Francisco. For establishing what that means. For other services mm-hmm. like homeless services and the free muni pass, things like that. Right. They are defying city a state law by not allowing indigent people to get this for free. So we're that's an avenue so you're we're pursuing work on that. now. We're gonna yep. work on that. You're gonna work on that. Compassion is very important in our society. Yes, it and is. I mean, it's it's a, it's a compassionate drug, cannabis a herb. Yeah, that we need to we treat it that way. We treat it as a medicine. Yep. You wouldn't deny a poor person penicillin. I wouldn't. And you shouldn't deny medical cannabis to people who need it because the prescription alternatives either are ineffective, don't work, right, or are bad side suboptimal. Effects, suboptimal. For example, yep. many types of seizure disorders, not just those in children, but those that affect adults, only respond to cannabis. No other anti-seizure medications work for their certain types of seizures. Okay. So to deny poor people the right to have these choices these is, alternatives. Is, Unfair. Is, is, is unbelievable to me. Okay, we are out of time on that note, but actually I want to end on another note. So almost ending on that note, not quite ending on that note. In May of 2011, on Vice.com, you did an interview, and you said, quote, David, we are in the golden age of weed. So some of these challenges and you know areas of improvement that remain, all of those things notwithstanding, how are you feeling? Do you still feel we're in the golden age of weed? Overall, are you guys optimistic about where where we're headed uh, at, a, at a macro level? These Or h- how are you feeling just at that? What's the short to long term future looking like? I'm really glad that adult personal use is legalized. But the regulations that Prop 64 and Marcrisa and the current state legislature have enacted need work. We need improvements. This is a work in progress. Civil rights didn't come with one or two pieces of legislation. It's an evolution, and we're still fighting for civil rights. Yes, Look we at are. gay people not even having employment discrimination protection in many of the states in this country. Right. We have a long way to go. Right. So we need to make it safe and affordable and accessible for people, and we need to integrate it into our culture. We know for a fact that when cannabis is made legal, opiate use goes down. The AMA showed that in states with medical cannabis access, opiate deaths are down 24%. Yep. Cannabis is a replacement drug for not just opiates, but for alcohol, for tobacco, for all sorts of noxious drugs, whether they're legal or illegal. People are replacing these drugs with much safer alternatives to cannabis. Right. The risk potential for cannabis is incomparably lower than okay. almost any other pharmaceutical drug on the market. Michael, your last... Yes. Thoughts. My last thoughts is is that we are sort of in the beginning of this cannabis uh, uh, movement and struggle. We're going to have more states across the country that that have uh, medical cannabis in the future, and they're going to be voting on it th- on it this this November. Oh, this we November, have the yeah. best cannabis in the world here in here in California, the Bay Area, and I think it's this is a long term struggle. This is this is going to this this will go on for. for numerous years oh yeah and if we can make a small difference on something we really care about uh we're gonna do it all right and, and david is telling you you've got to read this card what's the card here okay <laughs> oh he's not gonna let you read it after all all right no it's okay i okay. don't care sorry i don't care that's the all right we run the brownie mary democratic yes, you club do. we're having a meeting okay. on this wednesday october 10th okay at 6 15 p.m at 847 howard street okay. in downtown san francisco anyone 18 year older is welcome to attend you can go to our website, www.browniemarydemclub.com. That's browniemarydemclub.com. No, it's not. No, dot org. Dot org. Excuse dot me. Dot org. No, it's so com. I it's com. Are you sure? Yes. I have org in my Brownie notes. No, it's browniemarydemclub.com, I'm sure. I don't know. I wouldn't have put. Okay, well, anyway, put in com or org, and you'll find it, and, and you can go to their meeting. I wouldn't. It would, it would be highly unlikely for me to put org because I copied and pasted. Maybe you have both. Maybe you have I both domains. I think it's .com because I remember wondering why we couldn't get .org. Michael thinks it's .org. But our webmaster told us otherwise. <laughs> but All right. Okay. Anyway, whatever it is, it's brownymarydemclub.org or com. You can find it. Go look for it. The other thing that I, the other um, 
uh, website that I want to mention is Safe Access Now, which definitely is .org. So safeaccessnow.org. Right. And I also recommend CA Normal. That's N-O-R-M-L dot org. California Normal is a dedicated group. We're members of it. We work hard and support the organization whenever we can. And they do a lot of great work. And there's a lot of great information on their website as well. C-A-N-O-R-M-L dot org. Michael and David, thank you very much for being here. This was very illuminating and interesting and inspiring. Thank you for the work you've done. Thanks for, for sharing so much today. And like I said, we could have done, yeah, there is a lot to it. And we could have done, you know, like I said, five more episodes. And I also, like I said, we might, I might have to have you back to talk about some of the past of, the, of the, um, the gay civil rights work that you've done because that sounded really interesting too. And again, thank you for that. All right. So uh, best of luck and let's talk again soon. And that is all for today. Next week, Matthew DeCoster, producer of the San Francisco installment of Literary Deathmatch, will be on the show, as I mentioned at the beginning of today's show. Thanks again to today's guests, cannabis activists David Goldman and Michael Cohen. Thanks again, too, to Kevin Reed of the Green Cross Dispensary, which is at thegreencross.org, for helping uh, to make today's show possible. And last but certainly not least, thank you for watching and listening. If you liked the show, please share on social media. And subscribe, rate, and review on YouTube, iTunes, and or Google Play. For more about me, my website is MatthewFelix.com. And links to my social media, books, other podcasts, and all the rest can be found there. If you have any comments, ideas for the show, or just want to say hello, I would love to hear from you at FelixOnAir at MatthewFelix.com. Thanks again for watching. Uh, for watching. <laughs> Thanks again for watching and listening, and have a great week.